Okay, welcome to IBMI Education Week, day two. Today's focus is gonna be mainly on security. So I uh, hope you were able to join us yesterday and we had Tom and Chuck and they had some great information on um, IBMI in general, high availability. They had Brian Nordland join them from our team and then automation as well. Today's for focus, we're gonna have a two hour session couple breaks built in. We've got uh, security, defense, and depth. We've got real-world success stories, and then um, watching the layer security approach in action and demonstration. Tomorrow, day three, hope you'll be able to come back. We're going to have some discussion on modernization and AI strategies for IBMI, document management, and so forth. So there's going to be some good information. I'll go ahead and remind you at the end. So glad you guys were able to stick with us, and we will have some good information coming for you. Session one here today, we're going to be covering defense in depth, layers of security for IBMI. So, you know, security in general is all about those layers. And so we're going to explore that a little bit more here. I'm Sandy Moore. I'm a senior solutions engineer here at Fortra. I work with customers on IBMI for 21 years actually now and have enjoyed multiple facets of the business and being able to work and support testing, training, and then now really focused on helping customers find the right solutions to meet their current project needs. With me is my colleague and friend, Amy Williams. <laughs> if you would like to introduce yourself. Good morning. Uh, Amy Williams, Senior Security Consultant with Fortra. I've been working on the platform since uh, 2000 and have been working with customers from the other side of the phone calls um, for the last 10 years now. So really laser focused in on security from all of the other plethora opportunities there are in the IBMI about eight years ago. Awesome. So looking forward to being able to share the information with everybody today that we've got built in, Sandy. Yeah, we've got some good stuff for sure. All right. So uh, if you were here yesterday and you joined Tom, you probably heard some information about the IBMI Marketplace Survey. And uh, you know the IBMI Marketplace Survey that Tom does every year uh, pulls in information and provides what uh, you in the IBMI world in, are actually concerned about. And this year, cybersecurity went up pretty significantly. And so it is, definitely one of the top concerns for any IT environment. And, you know, we really saw that that growth in that. There's been a lot of drivers for that. And, you know, we really hope to bring the right information to you guys so you have the tools to meet those concerns and actually address them. So before we actually dive in, um, let's do a quick poll because I think that I want to understand, knowing what you guys are have responded in the in the uh, marketplace survey. survey yeah figure out really what you guys are working on because cybersecurity in itself is a is a pretty broad scope so i'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here i'm curious you gentle yeah <laughs> make sure go to cooperates with us today yes yes we you know sometimes there's some technical difficulties all right so what i mean my security projects are you currently working on you know, cybersecurity is, you know, like I said, it's a big, it's a big project. There's a lot to it. So really kind of just getting an idea of what the focus is. And, you know, Amy, you hear it's, it all the time. Right? I do. I'm really excited to see that right now um, in the lead is securing access to sensitive data, which has not generally been the no. leading um reason, right? It was yeah. complaints years ago when uh, yep. PCI and GDPR came out. And then, of course, our lovely friends, Malware and Ransomware, are continuing to hit shops all over the world. Um, but it's good to see that people are starting to take that next step, because that's definitely, yeah. you know, probably the most complex level is getting to securing the data itself beyond the access just to the system. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and that is true. I, you know, the sensitive data, it, it's been for so long, it's been the reason I'm doing this is because they told me I had to instead uh -huh. of this is the right thing to do and I'm protecting the business because we want to protect the business. So, yeah. all right. Security's I'm going to go ahead and close to get this. cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the new 
kids, the new cool kids on the block. Right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll there. If you guys want to throw a last minute, second vote in there, we've looks like most of you have responded already. So really the, the securing access to sensitive data seems to be the top uh, malware and ransomware protection is second, looks like compliance mm -hmm. mandates is third, then data encryption and then some other projects. So, all right, so different trend than we've been seeing. All right, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and close really that guy there. Yeah, so let me actually share that out. All right, so um, yeah, so there you go. 54% malware, 62% securing access, 38% yeah. meeting compliance, yeah. Pretty cool. And we're actually going to address all of those today, so I'm super excited. We are, absolutely. All right, let's move on. Why do we know that there needs to be conversations around security on IBM I? Well, every year we do a state of IBM I security study, and it's built on uh, the data from customer systems that we do our security scan uh, scans on. So that data is collected and built into a report where we share that information with you. And what we do see is that year over year, there's always room for improvement. Whether we're finding new uh, systems that haven't actually started their security journey or we have return customers to come back and do the scan over and over again as they implement more security measures, they want to see how they're doing. But Absolutely. what it comes down to what is their need for uh, some improvement? Amy, maybe you want to talk about those statistics there briefly yeah. and so kind of give us this what is we're always, seeing. Always fun, right? So when we talk about root profiles on the IBM I, we're talking about that all object, right? That coveted all object authority. Um, because once you have all object, you can elevate yourself to all the other special authorities. So it's not a matter of they only have all object, they can't do anything else all objects that gateway, right? So when we look at the number of systems that have a plethora of all object profiles, you can see that there's 30% that are not hitting those recommended levels, which is better than we've seen in the past. Um, and then to protect yourselves, right? We talked about access to the system versus just the, the data security. And that's where the exit programs come into place, right? It's really locking down who can access what processes and what interfaces to the system. So that's starting to increase, which has been a nice trend, but we're still less than 50%. Yeah, definitely. So you guys will have to watch for announcements. We do have the newest security study coming out in uh, I think April. So we'll have uh, the latest information from all the data we collected in 2023. So. Um, hopefully, we're going to see some improvement there. That's my that's my hope. Yep, we're doing yep. our job right, and getting that message out there. There's some improvement. So we have to also consider why are we even concerned about security on IBM I, right? Because the Always. system itself has this reputation of being a, the most secure operating system on the market. So, you know, I and I hear it. I just heard it a couple weeks ago. Oh well, mm -hmm. you know, we're not worried about the S400. It's it's secure. We don't have, nobody knows how to use it. <laughs> That's unfortunately not the case, is it, Amy? It amazes me that we still rely on that. And I, I am guilty, right? When I was an admin, I was guilty of the same thing, right? I relied on the fact that my user just wouldn't figure out how to use that Excel plugin. So everything was okay. Google has taken away that security. I will say right now. And now with AI, it's even more easy for people to figure out how to get around some of the controls we've put in place. Um, I like to tell customers that IBM is shipped to work and it works like mad, right? But it's not shipped secure. Now things are changing with 7.5. So if you're starting to move to 7.5, you're gonna start seeing some changes, especially with hardware migrations. But it is the most securable system, I would say, Sandy, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like I said there on the screen, some assembly required. So you just have to take advantage <laughs> of the options that are available to actually make that system more secure. Now, I, I had somebody joke with me one day, well, no, I can make my system really secure. And I said, and how's that? He said, unplug it from the network. Well, it's not gonna do you a lot of good that way. So we have to find some ways to get the balance in there, making it secure, but also making sure that it's available to do run the business like it's supposed to. 
All right. So what um, we've, of course, why are we securing it? Why do we need to care about it? There's a lot of threats out there that are going to actually threaten the security of the system and the information that's on it. And so as we start looking at and evaluating what the threats are, unfortunately, they're the same threats for any operating system, any platform, any business. Mm -hmm. Threat sources, uh, external. So, you know, there's a whole host of threat actors out there that would love to cause you problems as a business, get a hold of your information, Sometimes it's because they are just mean, but the outsiders, insiders, that internal threat. So users that have access to the system, Amy mentioned that all object authority, users that have root administrative privileges to the system, they're a threat. So, and you have to remember that an internal threat, it's maybe a disgruntled employee. It could be an accidental action that's taken by an employee. And I've got a lot of stories about that I can share um, yep. where somebody makes a mistake and it can affect the business. It's a threat to the business because there's damage, there's downtime, and now you're trying to figure out where, what point it, do you need to recover from? The one factor about, is real. Yeah, it is. And we've got some stories for that that we can go yeah. on all day. Do. Talk a little bit about the changing landscape, Amy, because I know yep. that's a threat source that that a lot of us don't really think about. Certainly. So not only is technology increasing, and I mentioned it a second ago with AI, but we've got to keep up with those threats. So what was a virus and a signature 10 years ago, those are still out there, but they are evolving and they're continually evolving and we have to continue to evolve with those. But beyond that, beyond ransomware, just the way that we are configuring our infrastructure, right? The cloud is a real thing. Most companies are dealing with a hybrid environment where some of your systems you can physically get to, maybe in their, they're in a co-location or maybe they're being hosted. Or maybe it's a whole mix where you have SaaS out there and being hosted where you don't have as much control as you used to or you're actually even hosting your infrastructure so that changing landscape and keeping up with it and where your responsibilities lie is really important and it it's a lot and we'll talk about some more of that in a minute yep absolutely so what's you know when we talk about what the concerns are with it, what's happening is the breaches so mm -hmm. um you know i pulled this from privacyrights.org and between February 2005 and February 2022, so 17 year span, there were almost 2 billion impacted records and 20,000 breaches, over 20,000 breaches reported in the United States. That's reported. Okay. What about all the breaches that weren't reported, right? So there's going, this is like the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that's happened out there. And that information's out there just waiting to be used. And so, you know, this is where where this information's going. So really having control over it and maintaining control over it and ensuring that those that information that you're holding is protected. Now, Amy, you went did some digging and you found some more interesting information about breaches. I did. Verizon's report's always really interesting. So when we look at this, they're talking about 74% of all the breaches are including a human element. And whether that is a, a whoops moment, right? The, the inevitable errors that happen or privilege misuse, right? We've given them privileges and we believe we've got the controls in place to ensure that's all they can use and they find a way around it or they expand that what we thought those abilities were and take advantage of it. And then of course, there's the stolen credentials or social engineering, which I would almost categorize in the same as stolen credentials because they're able to acquire <clears throat> credentials from your users, either through email, through phishing attacks, now SMS, the smishing attacks, and then I think the newest are the QR codes with the quishing mm -hmm. attacks, which is I think just fun to say. Um, <laughs> But we've got to be hyper vigilant, and we spoke about this the other day, Sandy. Being in security, we probably are hyper vigilant, and we we see these things coming, and we're suspicious of everything in our email box, and we really need our users to start getting there too. Yeah, and users, these are this. That's it. Only takes one 
to make the mistake, right? It doesn't take all of our users. It only takes one. And that I think that that user education and security awareness training is critical to uh, helping to head off some of these these breaches because it does start from inside. So, and of course, always the external actors and their motivation is financially driven, right? Money is king. Mm -hmm. So if they they have figured out how to make, this is a billion dollar business, multi-billion dollar business actually from, um, if we look back all the way to 2020 when it really exploded, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money and it's funding unfortunately a lot of bad things. And so they want more money, they're going to continue. So, when we think about it, you know, what are they after? Why are we concerned about it? Well, data is valuable, okay? And whether it's data theft, where it's being sold on the dark web, and it could be held for ransom, right? So there's the money factor. Um, but if they're selling it on the dark web, there's a money factor there as well. And sometimes it's just because they want to destroy it. They have a, a beef with the, your company or who you do business with or the country you are based in or the country you do business with. So there's okay. a lot of different um, drivers behind why they're going after the data. And we have to stop thinking that we're just a little company. We don't matter. We're not going to be a target. Anyone and anything is a target. They're going to go after anything they can possibly think that they're going to get anything out of. So, yeah. and we small businesses we are it. too. Yep. In the the data, they thought that the kind of ransomware attacks and and what we were seeing for breaches had kind of leveled off mm -hmm. in the end of 2022, coming into 2023, and then they've seen them spike and rise again. So. It is increasing, the number of attacks are increasing, and they're certainly targeting small businesses. So it's not just going after the Fortune 500. They are going after anyone and everyone that they think they can take advantage of. Absolutely. So with that, you know, we have to acknowledge um, that power systems can be impacted by this, and it is part of the equation core server for the business, it's going to see all of the traffic and activity. So they're going to follow that. And so they follow that trail and it can impact those power systems. Ransomware does hit power. It happens over and over again. I've got a couple of shares here of experiences that I've been through with customers in you know, half a million files encrypted by ransomware, an entire development server encrypted. Um, where sometimes it's the auto run worms that go through and hide all your folders that are shared. So, you know, whether it's disruption in availability or dis destruction of all those files in the IFS, it's mm -hmm. that's an impact. And the man hours that it takes uh, it to recover from this is monumental. So, really need to focus on power, making sure that it's secured so that it's not going to be part of this equation. Absolutely. And the new trend this year is the exfiltration of that data. So they're yeah. not just encrypting it or messing with it on your systems and leaving it there for hopefully you're able to recover. They're taking that data away and using yep. it. And again, like we spoke about on a few slides ago, they're selling it on the dark web and that market is huge. Absolutely. All right, so what are you gonna do about it? Um, well, our point of our conversation today is defense in depth. And it's really about adding all of those layers of protection. And the deeper your defenses are, the harder it is to get through it. So you're less likely to have something, an incident, and whatever that incident is, it's gonna be a lot smaller than if you had no layers in place. So when we talk about defense in depth, you know, there's, uh, there's some obvious things that you have to do to get started. And so when you're creating that defense in depth, um, before you even figure out what your layers are, you've got a couple of things that you're going to already have in place. And I'm going to make an assumption that you've um, tackled some of these, um, whether you're, you know, defining your policies. If you have regulatory or compliance requirements, you're going to have some policies in place already, but those policies may not be enough. So having your own internal corporate policies are crucial 
So you set the baseline, you set the, the bar to which you are going to meet your security measures. Yeah, Evaluating you'll settings. hear me, yeah. oh, sorry, uh, often say that compliance is not going to be security, but it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives you uh, that checklist to start going through and realizing what you do need to address, but it will not make you secure just being compliant. So we have to keep that in mind when we're going through these. Absolutely. And evaluating your settings. So making sure that whatever policy you have, and have you configured the system to meet that policy and continue to do that? Um, and then prioritizing your actions. What do you want to work on first? What's the low hanging fruit? Where do you start? So that's really where I think it gets people is that there's so many things that they need to consider they don't know where to start so we have actually a couple things that we we think you should start thinking about and the layers that you can prioritize so always system configuration is the first place to start um, and IBM does provide us a number of ways that we can secure that system and finding all of those different settings, whether it's system value settings or the defaults on your objects for how they're being created and secured. So starting with the, the patching levels, IBM is coming out with uh, regular PTFs. If you're not subscribed to get alerts for those PTFs, especially the security vulnerability PTFs, I strongly suggest you get on that mailing list. Um, staying current on PTFs is more critical than ever. It's not just functionality changes, but it's also security patching. And then leveraging all of those different controls. So IBM's introduced more controls. Um, again, I'll, I'll mention 7.5 quite often because IBM's making leaps and bounds where they're adding more and more controls to the user profiles and to the system to be able to really lock it down and give you control over the behavior and the access that your users have. And then we talked about it and, and it popped high on the survey today, which made me really excited, implementing object level security, getting to either a confidentiality model we'll call it where everything is public exclude and it, it's denied by default nobody can see it nobody can touch it they can't read it without being explicitly authorized to those data files we're getting to an integrity model where people might be able to access the data and see it but they can't change it without going through your program logic right it's one of the things that we lose with tcp ip and odbc is we don't have that application logic protecting the integrity of our data and what's there. And then user profiles, there's all kinds of switches in those user profiles that you can use to secure them. So far beyond just the special authorities, but also the behaviors, how often they can log in incorrectly, what that behavior is like when they log in incorrectly, how often they have to change their passwords, which I'm still a strong proponent of changing passwords on a regular basis, um, because you don't know where your users are using those passwords. And you won't know if that password got compromised outside of your facility, outside of your infrastructure that could possibly cause a compromise. And then <clears throat> IBM has always had an intrusion detection system that you can turn on with system values and with an auditing level value that will monitor the activity on the system for intrusions and be able to alert you and let you know that something fishy might be going on on your system. Yeah, I mean, it's got to start at the bait, right? The bottom. And mm -hmm. that system configuration is the, the best place to start, right? So that goes back to our securable versus secure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and it, it comes yeah. with it. It's built in. You don't have yep. to purchase anything to take advantage of a lot of these. Absolutely. Great suggestions, Amy. So another layer of defense is deed encryption. So this actually resonates with you guys, I'm sure, because uh, based on the poll, the protecting that sensitive data on the system. So being able to encrypt the data on the IBMI. So actually protecting the valuable information, focusing on those pieces of information that are crucial to the business. And everybody's going to have a different 
different definition of what is sensitive information. If you're working in healthcare, it's going to be the um, the patient information, those EMRs. Um, it could be credit card information, although we do see that less and less on the IBMI, but every once in a while, somebody pops up and says, nope, we've got credit cards on the system. So mm -hmm. in those, protecting that information, the financial information, or if you've got your um, employee payroll information on the system, that PII data, right? That's important. I don't want you to spread my, uh, expose my my employee information. I want you to protect that. Uh, it depends on who you do business with as well. So we've had a lot of, of um, folks we've spoken with about encryption where the um, online, big online seller that we all know of, um, they actually require that the customer data is encrypted at rest. Mm -hmm. So if you're using IBM I on your back end, that's going to be driving that. So yep. encrypting the valuable information on IBMI, um, we can use field procedure programs to actually encrypt that data at the field level. You know, I, IBMI is different it's than, than all the other servers out there. You can't just throw, you know, hardware encryption is, and you can't encrypt everything. It doesn't work that way with the DB2 structure of IBMI. So focusing on the fields that have that sensitive data and using those field procedure programs to encrypt it and decrypt it at, as requested for the authorized users is um, an excellent layer to protect the information even from those all object users that we've been talking about. So making mm -hmm. sure that we're protecting information regardless of who you are, we're going to, to abide by that. When we talk about disk encryption, I always laugh because you know, really it's, uh, if you you're, you have a, uh, hardware encryption, your disk mm -hmm. is stolen, you're good, right? But what is the, 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 the thing that is done best is, is uh, securing that server room, right? So what are the odds of your disk being stolen in this day and well, age? And when we think about it, when I talk about the confidentiality configuration versus the integrity configuration, Encrypting that critical data really can get you to that confidentiality mode without having to go to the deny by default on all of your data objects. Because yeah. you can have that segregation of access, you can have that confidentiality built in without having to make any program changes. By yeah. using the field procedures, it happens between the OS and the DB2 database that is shipped as part of your IBM I. So it allows a lot of flexibility for customers to be able to implement some really strong protections to their data without a lot of effort on the development side, which is always a concern when you're trying to get these things done, is making sure that we have enough runway, right, and a timeline that's reasonable. We don't want 10-year projects trying to get these things done. We need to be more efficient and more quick. And the field procedures allow you to do that. Absolutely. Pretty slick. So, and keep in mind, if the data is encrypted and masked from unauthorized users, it's going to be unreadable when it is exposed. So you have now taken away that exposed data. The, uh, you know, and when we talk about object level security versus mass data from encryption, you know, users can still have that use authority use authority on, on the database is going to expose it. That's read authority, which is exposure. But if they can't read it, they're not gonna be able to expose it. So it protects it in so many ways and ensures that the you're not only meeting the requirements if you have those specific requirements, but you know as the business that you have protected it the best possible. Absolutely. Virus and ransomware protection. So this has always been, this is a hot topic, and which is surprising that it wasn't the top thing today on our poll. I'm surprised it usually comes yep. right up there. So you all have virus protection in your network. Your PCs, your workstations, your Windows servers, all of those have protections in place. Absolutely crucial, but we stop. We don't think about the IBMI needing to have that protection as well. Now remember, this is defense in depth. This is the additional layers. This is the layer that counts on your core server. So using native virus scanning is 
the best approach where you're actually scanning the IFS natively through programs that live on the IBMI, tying into the infrastructure that IBM provides. So they actually, it's been 20 years, they added mm -hmm. the infrastructure to support that native virus scanning. Trying to scan from a PC or a Windows server is dangerous. You open up a Pandora's box of problems by trying to do that. It doesn't understand the operating system. It requires an all object profile with access to uh, the root directory. So now you've undone some of the settings that we recommend that you lock down. So making sure that the system itself isn't acting as a host to that malware. We've seen it over and over again that the IBMI is a very happy host. It will store malware on your server for all time until you finally scan for it. And it's never good practice. I don't know anybody that said, yeah, I'm okay with storing malware on our core server. It's just not a good practice. So ensuring that you don't have that sitting on your system is crucial. Virus scanning um, through on access scanning. So those users that do have access to those file shares and have the ability to access them, whether it's through a map drive, uh, you've got a discoverable share that can be found through the network, but also even if they have an ACS, the option to access the integrated file system that way. Mm -hmm. You can upload and download files. You can upload files to the IFS through FTP. You can, you're gonna have anything that you use on the IBMI that has a graphical representation is using the IFS. So your other applications that have the web interface with the fancy graphics, that's all stored in the IFS. So it's a crucial part of the system. So we need to make sure we're scanning it and making sure that it doesn't have that malware on it. And you brought course, up a great point about FTP, Sandy, really quick, yeah. is the supply chain. And yeah. <clears throat> even if you have your net server shut off, which I know a few customers have been able to accomplish because they've you know, created an FTP infrastructure that is outside of their IBMI. But you're still receiving those files from third parties, from outside of your infrastructure. You don't necessarily want to just trust those files as is and that they're doing the right thing too. So being yep. able to scan those files and upon uh, receipt is a huge game changer in ensuring that you're securing that supply chain when you're receiving those files from any partners through any of your EDI processes also. 100%, you know, assuming everybody else is doing their due diligence and has scanned the files before you get them is never gonna be a good practice. So the other way with the protection of the system with this layer is using an exit program that can actually monitor for malicious access patterns. So in some ransomware attacks, they've stopped self-replicating because they get dis they're discovered too quickly. So what happens is then they have access to the IFS through a share and they start encrypting files and all they're doing and is actually mm -hmm. encrypting those files, they're not actually dropping ransomware. Well, your native virus scanning can't, doesn't see encrypting a file as malware. So by using an exit program that can monitor the access pattern of the users, monitor their behavior, you can actually block attacks. So basically reducing the blast zone. So watching the authorized users connecting, seeing what they're doing, oh, wait, they're doing some really suspicious activity. They're doing a, a very rapid programmatic read, rename, encrypt, and delete of the stream files. You need to block them before they actually impact all of the files they have access to. So really making sure that this system isn't going to be the one the most damaged in the attack. Absolutely. All right, so yeah. Good layer here, and you know I think it's crucial. I, I think everybody's familiar with the concepts of virus scanning and 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 being able to block ransomware. It's just when we it thinking about it in terms of the IBMI is really where the hmm head scratching comes in. Well, and what right. I I think is the strongest thing for this is it's going to take action for you, right? This yep. isn't a report you're going to get. This isn't something you've got to review. This is 
you know, this is taking action for you at discovery point, right? It discovers a known signature. It's gonna quarantine those files. It detects that anomalous behavior. It's gonna block those connections. So it's working hard for you as soon as you configure it and have it in place. Yep. All right, so of course we gotta think about how are they getting to the system and uh, actually able to do this. So our next layer is a really critical part of that as well. And we've talked about it, we've hinted at it. So those external accesses, right? All the different interfaces to be able to get into the IBMI, whether it's FTP or it's ODBC, or it's through the data transfer pieces that are built into ACS. So exit points are built into the IBMI. They've shipped them with our ability to be able to utilize them. So IBM exposes a lot of activity and you can see a lot of things going on, but you can't see what's happening through those different interfaces, not down to the detail level. So with exit points, we have been able to now parse all of that data coming through those exits and allow you to create rules to be able to block that data, right? Because when you're not on the green screen, when you're outside of your application logic, it's just the user and the data, and they can have a field day with that, and they can get to anything that you haven't secured. They can download it, they can change it, they can corrupt it, they can delete it. So with exit points, you can actually put in those rules to ensure that they're only able to download, that they're only able to upload to that one specific work file that they're supposed to be able to upload to before they take the menu option to post those GL entries to. I know that with Exit Point Manager, again, uh, those supply chain connections, because you've given those service profiles access, you've given them often elevated access, ensuring that they can only access what they're supposed to when they come in through your FTP server, when they come in through DDM, the Exit Points can allow you to actually lock that down and ensure those pieces are in place to limit their access once they've authenticated to your system. Absolutely. And you know, for me, I think Amy, that the 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 chilling part here is with these PC interfaces is that you have no visibility to them. None. Right? Without yep. having exit programs in place, you don't know who's using each of these access points to the system. So how do you know if it if it's a, an appropriate access or not. And the fact that it users are very often have much more access to the system and privileges at the, at the um, object level, but also with their special authorities, mm -hmm. this is all gonna apply regardless of how you get in there. You know, and I had somebody tell me yesterday, you know, my users, they don't know how to do anything. They wouldn't yep. know how to take advantage of these entry points to the system. And I said, well, guess what? The bad guys, the threat actors, they don't have their own credentials. They're using your user's credentials. Yeah. So you want to make sure that they can't do things that are inappropriate. And we, we see it happen often where people are poking around and they start taking advantage of the access they've been given, especially through those interfaces. But sometimes I, it's a shortcut, right? It made my life easier. Yep. It made my job easier because I found a way to do this without doing it the long way that I was taught. So mm -hmm. and we'll go back to Google, right? The ability oh. to search online for anything you want. And, and beyond Google, any, uh, you know, yeah. the chat GPT, it's real. Right. Yep. You ask it the question, it will hand you the instructions. So relying on users not knowing how is not a viable security solution any longer. No. No. Agreed. So yeah, let's get so to our, our last layer because this one's the most fun and I think everybody's yeah. going to be familiar with it, but it's rare. Yeah. On the IBM multi-factor authentication. Yeah, you know this is one that doesn't come up that often. Um, it, although it seems to over the probably the last I'd say year, I've seen an in, a huge increase in interest in it and awareness of the fact that you can do multi-factor authentication for IBMI. 
And so being able to have that, um, uh, that last layer of defense, well, and actually if we're thinking about it, it's, it's your first layer of defense. So when somebody connects to the system, is it really them? Before they get to any of these other areas, before they get to the exit point security, before okay. they get to the virus and ransomware protection, before the data encryption, this is gonna be that, are you really, Sandy, connecting to the mm -hmm. system? So taking the something you know, which is your password, and then adding something you have or something you are. So an additional key, an additional code, the biometric fingerprint, and actually confirming that this user is who they say they are. So we want to be sure that we have validated that user. You know, Amy, I think in, you and I talked about this recently. Usually uh, at, we've seen a big increase in single sign-on. And so really making it so easy for people to connect to everything in the network that they need to connect to. Yep, absolutely. And the the authentication and proving who you are is, you know, so important these days because of those credentials. If they do get compromised, there's nothing between that bad actor and your system. And MFA really kind of adds that additional piece in. One of the other pieces I like is beyond just, you know, I'm authenticating to the system, I'm proving who I am, but we can do this for specific processes. So you can elevate this so that if you've got a highly sensitive process in your environment, add that MFA authentication requirement. Make sure that the user that's doing that activity is really who they say they are because a user ID and a password isn't enough anymore. No, it really isn't. And you know, we get password settings for users. We're going to circle back system configuration. If you have weak password settings, you have weak passwords, and those weak passwords are going to be compromised. So, user that has the easy to guess password, the one that's on that list of mm -hmm. known exposed passwords, yep. that's going to be used, or the default passwords, right? We get a lot of that. Where yeah, you well. Write Password's the same. I well, think last year we still had a number of systems in the study, and I'm curious to see where it lands this year, where the password link was less than five characters was required. I right? We've feel, got non-expiring passwords. So again, being able to ensure, and at a minimum for your administrators, I will stress that, right? Because it becomes overwhelming and people are like, oh, I can't. I can't implement that for my thousands of users. Implement it for your golden key holders is how I refer yep. to the administrators, right? Because yep. if you're protecting your domain credentials and if you, you know, are having separation of duties between your uh, Active Directory regular everyday credentials versus your domain admin credentials, Start thinking about your IBMI administrators in the same way. They are domain admins of that IBMI server. And they need to protect their credentials as much as you protect your domain admins. And it really puts it into context for, for some of our customers when we, we point that out. It is your core system. Most of the time it's running your entire business, if not the heart of your business. Absolutely. And I've seen with uh, sometimes the uh, cybersecurity or cyber insurance policies are mm -hmm. starting to really crack down. You can't just pay an extra amount of money on your policy every year because you don't have these layers in place. And I think some of the struggle is not understanding that you can actually add this to IBMI whether it's tying it into your existing authentication methods. So if you have a radius server, and you know, there's a whole host of them out there, Okta, Duo, mm -hmm. um, Alien, Alien Vault, Forta Token. There's a ton of, of authentication options and you probably already have authentication for signing into the network. You can actually tie that into the IBMI and do that authentication with those devices you already have set up. So it doesn't have to be a whole new set of, of of actions and, and a whole new set of devices that the user is going to have to deal with. So being yep. able to do that, and it's not just the green screen. So you can authenticate for the green screen. 
So when we when we get to that front door of the system, logging in, we can authenticate there. But you can also authenticate if the user is connecting through the file server, if they're connecting through the uh, database server and pulling the data off the system, right? Remember that piece? Mm -hmm. uh, or if they're coming in through FTP, really need to have control over who has FTP and making sure that when that FTP connection is made, that it's really the right person, that it is Sandy, it is Amy. Yep. It's not somebody who got Amy's credentials through some network sniffing program and obtained that because we're not going to expose our passwords and fall for that business email compromise. But if there's a, a, a breach of the network and that, that data has been compromised that way, we're not going to know that. All right. So really, I think this is a good solid, solid ideas for de defense in depth, Amy, and having those layers in place and available to be able to create that, that infrastructure. Absolutely. All right. So, so <clears throat> I need to grab a glass of water, I know. Um, absolutely. So I think okay, we, guys. we do a quick break here. We'll do a quick break. We'll do five minutes. I'm going to go ahead and set my timer. I don't have one for the screen, but we will circle back in about five minutes. So if you guys need to do the same, please feel free. If you have any questions or anything that kind of sparked your interest there, and uh, you go ahead and throw questions into the panel there, and we might be able to uh, tackle some of those at the yep. end of today as well. So. All right, so stand by. We'll be right back with you guys in five minutes. So nine, or sorry, eight fifty-two. If you're in Pacific time. Pacific. Do we want to do all the translations? Ten fifty-two for Central. There you go. Eleven fifty-two for Eastern, and then when we come back, we're going to have a panel discussion. We invited Chuck Lazinski back from yesterday to join us, talk a little bit more about real world um, things that we've seen out there. Awesome. All right, stand by. We'll be right back.
All right. Ready to rock and roll. I believe yeah. Chuck has joined us. Are you with yep, us, Chuck? Chuck's here. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Yeah. Welcome. All right. We've got a really good audience here. So glad you were able to join us. All right, guys, we're done with the coffee break. And let's talk about our next section. All right, so back to IBMI Education Week. Uh, session two here, we are going to be um, talking about some real world success stories with IBMI security. So we thought a panel discussion would be nice for this because you know it's about experiences, it's about what you've done and what, you've, what we've seen in the real world and how other customers have had these experiences. So I pulled together today. Um, Amy, of course, is with me. Uh, you, Amy and I have been talking to you for the last hour, but we've added Chuck Lazinski here. Chuck, would you mind introducing yourself? Well, sure. Thanks for asking. Uh, I've been with Fortra, formerly Help Systems, for about 25 years. And uh, you know, one of the questions that I get when I, I talk uh, security on IBMI is, you know, you're mostly a robot automation guy. Why are you talking about security? Well, <laughs> it turned out that, <laughs> turned out that that back in 2007, we actually created a product called Robot Security, and uh, then we uh, acquired PowerTech in 2008, and of course the rest is history. And we've also been teaching IBM I security uh, since uh, going back to about 2000, and of course it's a uh, that's a top concern, needless to say, in our marketplace study, as well as across all of our product lines here at Fortra. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you could join us. I know that I uh, drug you into the dark side here, so appreciate that. Great um, fun. Yeah, so yeah, I think we'll just, let's have some fun here with this. Uh, really want to talk about, you know, we've been, we've been talking about our defense in depth implementations, and, uh, you know, we really want to talk about how this has been rolled out, what people have actually done with this. So I think we'll just kind of have everybody um, share a little bit, uh, some stories and, and what, they, what they've what they seen. Um, and let's start with system configuration. Amy, would you like to? Oh, sure. I, I love yeah. system configuration. It's amazing what we still continue to find um, out there when we're doing our risk assessments <clears throat> and the I, I'm going to sound like a broken record today because I'm going to keep going back to passwords and user profile controls and ensuring that you, you know, have those password complexity rules up to date using password rules, ensuring that you have to, you know, meet those complexity rules, even as an administrator, right? The administrator can't go and change a password to, you know, the the word dog or something even similar um, because your passwords, you know, the, that complexity is still important. The, the password spray attacks do still happen. And then how we handle those um, invalid sign-on attempts, right? When our users don't get that password right the first time, like many of us, I know I'm on the reports on a weekly basis because first time is never a given that I'm going to get that password right. <clears throat> but if I get it wrong enough times, my profile should be getting disabled, right? Allow the system to help you as much as it can to secure your system. So being able to put those kinds of configurations in place, ensuring that the programs that you're restoring to your system are the programs that were compiled, right? And they haven't been tampered with, that they are not configured to be able to behave in an inappropriate way, right? There's the user domain programs and there's the system state programs, right? So there's a lot of controls that people ignore often in the system values. Um, the other is logging, believe it or not, we still have um, shops out there that haven't turned the audit journal on. They have absolutely no security logging turned on on their systems at all, which, and we talked about visibility earlier, Sandy. There's no visibility if you don't have that audit journal uh, turned on. So 
Um, a lot of things can happen on your system without your knowledge if you don't have any kind of monitoring or tracking turned on for that. So those are probably some of the most critical system configuration pieces that we have to continually uh, remind people of and highlight, right? Um, sharing, and I know you'll talk about this a little bit on that, that third level, but the, the shares and the way that you have your uh, root file system configured, right? Ensuring that that's yeah. read only. Yeah, I just actually talked to somebody yesterday, don't have the audit journal turned on and they had a profile with thousands of invalid sign-in attempts and they have they have no nothing to go look at to see what actually happened. Who is mm -hmm. actually, you know, where is this request coming from? What job is doing this? And, you know, and that audit journal is critical and so but we can help with that, right? I mean, that's one of our things that we can do is to provide you with assistance with this this layer of defense through the security services, right? Absolutely, we do it all the time. So that's where you're going to be able to actually assist people with making these changes and finding those things that should be set differently and maybe got overlooked or yeah. somebody changed it. And one of those, you know, pieces are, and I think the strength of our security services is that um, we come from an administrative background. We were the administrators on the ground. We have unfortunately experienced uh, incidents in our careers that we've had to recover from. So when we're working with customers and we're helping them harden their systems, get them to a more secure state, we are really coming from experience. Um, you know, that number one priority is not to interrupt operations, and the number two priority is to get you the most secure as possible. Um, so working with customers, whether it's through our managed security services, the, the monthly subscription where you get reports from us where we're monitoring changes to your system, or it's doing the deep dive risk assessment that goes a little bit, you know, far beyond what the security scan does that we use for this study, that risk assessment lets us really do a top to bottom evaluation of the configuration of your system. And we can help you build that plan when we talk about prioritization of what to do next, because you can't do it all, right? You, you can't change everything in a day. You really need to have a plan to be able to, to move through those pieces. Absolutely. Being careful, like you said, I, and I really like that point that um, making sure that, you know, the security measures you implement don't impact the business, right? You don't want to make things yeah. so secure that um, you make things That's unavailable. That's an incident in itself. And I, right? And I have been, you know, at the heart of some of those, either by purposefully or, or not purposely when I was, yes. you know, an administrator. So, absolutely. I, unfortunately, yeah, I've done that. Mind. Yeah. I, you know, it makes me think of a story. I had a, a one of the recommendations we make for securing your your IFS and and the root directory. There's an authorization list that you can okay. use. Qsys.live doesn't get Im impacted through a, a root share. Not mm -hmm. that you should share the root. Don't share the root. I don't do it. <laughs> we had somebody who misunderstood the recommendation, and so instead of changing the authorization list to public exclude. Mm -hmm. They changed the root directory to public exclude. Oh, yeah. And when, yeah, that could suddenly, be a... right. So you have to be careful with this. So having assistance in in somebody who understands what the impacts are going to be of those changes, helping you is, I think, a, a a big deal. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you know we've got a pretty good you know team there with the uh, security services and really assisting with the system configuration. But you guys don't just do system settings. You work with all of our, our tools as well. So, you know, not only do you understand you do. The, the settings on the system, but how all of these layers that we're talking about today uh, work together to protect the system. So uh, really a, a holistic approach there. I love it. Well, one of those layers is the data encryption, right? So, Chuck, this is this is your surprise, your moment to shine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, and it's been a it's been a great journey with uh, the whole data encryption thing. Uh, it's it's pretty awesome technology, and uh, you know it's really we're really talking two components here. We're talking encryption of data at rest and encryption of data at flight. In flight, this topic is encryption of data at rest. All right, so you know Sandy and I have have been involved heavily in in talking to um, prospects and, and customers about how to go about encrypting the data at rest. And the first question or that we usually have is, what has initiated the project, the data encryption project? And mm -hmm. in the past, we would have said, um, you know, it would have been around PCI compliance, you know, storing credit card yeah. information on the system, right? But that's pretty much been taken care of but what's come in are uh, audits around PII, storing PII data, GDPR, uh, JSOX, Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, and so forth. Uh, so those typically initiate the encryption project, either a failed audit or you know, maybe the end user or the end user, the, our our customers are trying to be proactive. And actually, we've seen quite a bit of that, haven't we, Sandy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice to hear the, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And we want to protect this information as opposed to the auditors are making me do it. Right. Or the insurance company is making me do it. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And you know, I heard that the other day with a customer and I was just like, I love that. Thank you yeah. for sharing that with me because it just, it made my heart happy because, you know, you and I, Chuck, we've been working on this a lot together and, you know, we brainstorm, we work with our whole team here to really uh, understand PowerTech encryption and all that we can do with it. But, you know, having somebody say, yeah, this is what we want to do. And I geek out on it. I yeah. love working with <laughs> PowerTech encryption. <laughs> I'm well, a little nerdy. <laughs> and, well, and a common thread through all this is education. Right, you know, mm -hmm. Amy talked about that just a just a minute ago about uh, educating um, our users on the technology and and uh, how it can protect you. You know, the other reason that people get into projects like this are um, their customers in a business to business relationship require that their customer data be encrypted. Okay, yeah. so it might not even be necessarily an audit, but it's the customer saying, you know what, if we're going to do business with you, you have to encrypt the data when it's at rest. So a couple of things we run into, for instance, are the timeline. You know, how mm -hmm. long do they have to put encryption in place to satisfy the, their customer requirements or maybe a state mandate for data protection? And of course, M many states have data protection compliance requirements and just you just got to figure that every state is going to have a data protection compliance requirement at some point. Yep. So understanding the timeline is important. And then kind of the next hurdle is um, finding the data, understanding your data dictionary. Mm -hmm. All right. But then also working with your your uh, IT security group and your CISO and and whoever else to understand exactly what data needs to be encrypted. Okay, mm -hmm. if if you've got two fields, a first name and a last name, uh, address, city, state, zip, and so forth, what data needs to be encrypted? Does the internal customer ID need to be encrypted? All right, so that's you know up for up for debate. Um, so, how does the project get started? Um, in a POC, for instance, it it starts with education. All right, Sandy already talked about the difference between full disk encryption versus field level data at rest encryption. All right. Data, uh, the, the full disk encryption really doesn't do you any good unless your hardware is stolen. Uh, then we would have a discussion around what really is a field procedure. And the fact that the field procedure technology came out in 7.1 of the operating system, it's very mature. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like an exit program. That's how I describe uh -huh. it. 
um, in terms of uh, like a communication exit point. It's kind of like that in that any access to the data at rest has to work through this exit program or field procedure is what it's called. And in fact, when you initiate the field procedure, you'll actually see something new when you do a display file field description command uh, on a file. You'll actually see a program at the field level, and that's where it calls our encryption and decryption process. And any protocol that accesses the data, ODBC, JDBC, RPG, uh, a, a display physical file member, has to work through that field procedure. In fact, the yeah. only time the field procedure isn't called is when you do a, a save object, because then the data actually gets stored out on tape, encrypted. Um, uh, some people bring up RCAC, Row and Column Access Control, and that's an IBM technology that, that masks the data, but it, it does not encrypt right. the data at rest, right? Yeah, hides it, hides it from the user, but it is not actually protecting it. Yeah. Yeah, and Absolutely. then some real world uh, examples. We had a customer contact us, a very large customer, saying they actually stored a password on every system that they, <laughs> they they had, and they had to encrypt that password ASAP. That's all uh -huh. they had. They had one field that they wanted to encrypt, <laughs> oh, and uh, so that was that was like a one and done. I mean, it was easy. Um, of course, we see a lot of PII projects out there now. I've Definitely. seen as many as 12,000 encrypted fields wow. on a single system. I know from the customers, oh, <clears throat> from the customer's perspective, because I haven't gotten to implement encryption yet. That's still on my bucket list for, for services. Sure. Um, but from a customer's perspective, I come back from the 2000 four time frame when PCI started coming out 2006. Mm -hmm. And you were relying on your vendors' applications because we were still storing credit cards on the eye. Mm. They had to come up with those algorithms. They were doing it programmatically because the field procs weren't around yet. Right. And it was painful and it was dangerous and you were relying on something else. What I love about our encryption solution is that programmers don't have to be involved. We don't have to make changes to their applications for them to be able to take advantage of this. And it shortens that timeline that you were talking about, Chuck, yeah. from yeah. a customer's perspective. Yep. Like that level of effort is, you know, is doable, right? It's palatable. It's not yeah. as daunting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Amy, that being said, 99% of the time we end up working with the programmers <laughs> just because they tend, <laughs> they tend to also be the, in some ways, kind of the, the system experts. administrators, the experts mm -hmm. at the application, right? So. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm really referring to them not having to make code changes. Yes, right? exactly. But yeah. absolutely identifying those fields, right? I, I cringed a little bit because it's, it's interesting to me in the IBM I world how few data owners there are that yeah. really understand the data that's sitting on their systems and where that data lies, right? You talk about identifying those fields. Yeah. Well, they know they want to encrypt this certain type of data, but they may not know all the different places that data resides because often it is not just in one place, like the, the example right. you gave of the password, right? Yeah. They've got those account numbers all over the place or they have, you know, the customer's address information stored in six different tables because that's the way the application was designed. And having to find yeah. all that and help them identify that, I think, is a huge advantage we give our customers with the services experience you guys have. Sure. Yeah. And, and the last point I'll make is just to kind of repeat what you just said. It's not necessarily a one and done thing. There'll be a initial phase one and then um, as time goes on and additional data uh, or sensitive fields are detected, then you mm -hmm. continue the process. So anyway, yeah, we're happy yeah, to talk to anybody absolutely. who's interested. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate that feedback. I, you know, I think that people don't, in a lot of this, you don't realize that you have these options available for the IBMI. We really just, 
you know, don't even realize that that these you, you can implement these layers of protection for the system. So <clears throat> appreciate that. I'm sure that you will be talking to some folks after this. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, and actually my last, before, before I move on, I was going to add to that, you know, one of the points you made, Chuck, is that um, with the, using the field procedures in PowerTech encryption, it's application agnostic, right? It doesn't matter how you get at the data, it's going to be protected. So okay. there's not the, oh, I have access to command line, I can go into SQL and I can access it and see it. So nobody gets to do that, that sneak around and find a different way, which is all you're going to get with the, uh, with the application masking, somebody can use a backdoor in, in the different yeah. different right avenue on. to access it, and it's in the clear. So, right so important. All right. So I'm uh, I'm gonna talk about virus and and ransomware protection. So, you know, this is something, and I, I said it before, near and dear to my heart. I have worked with the PowerTag antivirus uh, for since its inception, and it's been it's been a couple of years. And, you know, so this has really exploded in interest because as we've talked about, the threats to the system are so, so, so prevalent. Um, and we're seeing, you know, systems that are being impacted by ransomware, not once, but twice. So, mm -hmm. you know, these, these ransomware attacks are not happening a single time. They're actually circling back and attacking uh, those same servers again after you've recovered. So, and to Amy's point, the exfiltration piece of it, you know, they're not necessarily looking for encrypting the data. They're more about exposing it. So, but what we really want to do, you know, with PowerTech Antivirus is create that layer. So scanning those files as the users are opening and closing them. So, you know, what I've worked with customers to do is to um, optimize scanning. So we make sure that any user who has access to that file server and those shares or and even without the shares, if you've got access through ACS to the integrated file system, or you have applications that use the file server to pull data on and off the system, we need to make sure that, that these files that are being moved back and forth off the server are not infected. So, and it only takes that one user to create a problem, right? One person needs to disable their protection on their workstation, and they open that file. I had a company that they had a ransomware attack in 2017. They, a huge mess, they recovered from it. Um, I talked to them last year and we, they were, they, you know, decided that they wanted to look at virus protection for their IBM I. And we did an initial trial setup and scan of their system. And we found all these copies of this ransomware. I got all excited. I'm like, hey, you guys have ransomware on your system. I said, oh, we know about that. That was from 2017. We cleaned it all up. They said, but you didn't. You still have ransomware on your server. And they said, well, we cleaned up all the workstations. They said, well, you still have it on your server. And they said, well, but nobody has access to it. We looked at the attributes on the file and somebody mm -hmm. had been trying to open that file just weeks before our conversation. So, you know, they're, the files are still there. They're still available. And you get somebody who has that, that mindset of, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to disable all these protections, they're going to cause a problem. So really just making sure that it's not that, that server that's impacted by it. I have a lot of unfortunate conversations with folks that haven't taken that the initiative to protect the system before something, an incident happens. We call them incidents, right, Amy? <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it, and they will continue to happen. I, I, I'm baffled continually at the comfort level people have of allowing viruses to remain on their IBM I and reinfect their PC systems. And they're relying on the PCs to be able to stop it. The difference with ransomware is it doesn't care. It actually just finds that SMB share, and it doesn't care that it's an IBM I share, doesn't care if it's a Windows share, and I'm going to date myself, and I'm going to say a NetApp file system. <laughs> it's going to encrypt those files. It's going to read those files. It's going to mess with your system. It, does, it doesn't care, and the, the virus protection software is not going to stop it. 
Yeah, and that's where I, you know, the, the game changer here is the anti-ransomware technology that we added to Partic Antivirus in being able to, to actually monitor the access patterns of those users. Now remember, we've already author we've authorized these people to connect to the system, and they're the the ransomware is using your users' credentials. So now we need to make sure that you know we're actually seeing is are they doing something that is suspicious? And within a ransomware exit program, we're going to be able to block that user. So if they exceed the 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 tolerance that you decide is appropriate for your system, they exceed that tolerance of that read, rename, encrypt, and delete of those stream files they're gonna be cut off. So they are no longer gonna be able to damage the IFS. So you're still gonna have a Windows systems to clean up. You're still gonna have other issues, but the core server is not gonna be the thing you're gonna spend all your cleanup time on. Right. One of the other advantages I think we have is that we know that there's processes out there that you may have where you are intentionally encrypting a directory of yeah. files. And that's part of your regular process. We have that ability in that software to be able to set those thresholds differently for those processes. Yep. So you don't turn it off and you don't ignore them because ignoring is not safe. <laughs> but no, no. You can change those thresholds so that that process can continue, right? We talked about operations being, you know, one of the top priorities. We don't want to inhibit your processes, right? Because that's, that's money out the door that, that you know, you're leaving yourself open for a, a worse incident if something gets compromised. Um, so the flexibility that our anti-ransomware um, functionality has is I think huge and a game changer. And it, it kind of rolls right into that exit point security. Mm -hmm. I was just um, thinking that. Right, so with exit point security, and this is one of the most fun products that I do get to implement with customers because I'm, I'm a bit of a, a, a data hoarder and I love data and I want to see as much as I can. And uh, our exit point manager tool really opens up the ability to see everything that's happening on the system. I can see the exact SQL statements that are being run. So we can identify what tables are actually being accessed. We can see through the FTP server if they're running remote commands or if they're really just doing send and receive file type activities and where they're sending and receiving those files. Exit Point Manager not only allows you to lock things down, right, and, and gives you that level of protection, but it really allows you to see and get visibility to what's happening on your system. And it, it's always the, the conversation of, I didn't know they were doing that when we do these implementations with customers mm -hmm. and the discovery that happens. Yeah, it's usually mind blowing. The first time you turn on that auditing, um, especially I think database server, right? Those oh, yeah. SQL transactions, people are like, what? I didn't mm -hmm. know they did that. So yeah, yeah. it's 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 eye opening, and you know, having that visibility, I just it's it it's mind boggling that you can't see. You know, it's you don't know what you don't know, and yep. it gives you that ability. Now we know what's what's happening. Let's go ahead and implement some controls, yep. right? And we yeah. have introduced new functionality recently in Exit Point Manager, which really brings that exposure up to, to your fingertips. So you can see how many transactions are happening across all of the different mm -hmm. exit points. And you can drill right down into it and you can build rules right from that screen as you're doing that discovery and starting to understand what's happening on your system, right? And whether that rule is that, okay, that's known and we know that that profile is doing that and that's good so we can you know turn auditing off and we're going to allow those transactions to happen to oh my goodness we don't know why they're doing that let's shut that down until we have a good reason for them to be able to do that access and creating those rejection rules uh, on the fly it it's yeah for me doing the implementations and, and helping customers see what's happening on their systems and understanding what's going on just simply for uh, profile remediations. I've got a customer that like took it to, you know, the hilt with exit point manager and identifying those profiles and, you know, 
restricting it down to just those they saw. And now any new user that's going to attempt to do those types of activities have to put in those requests, has to get implicit permission to be able to do those activities. So it's not just a free for all. The system gets shipped to work for us. The system gets shipped to us to be a workhorse and to run without any impediments. It's really up to us to be able to put those protections in place. Yeah. Um, SQL Server is fun. FTP, I implemented this for a customer and we started looking at the logs and there was a whole bunch of IP addresses that were not from this country. And the question came up of, do you have your IBM I exposed to the web? And they did. And they thought it was safe. And they thought they Oops. were okay. They, yeah. within days, implemented a firewall and started protecting their IBM I because <laughs> they had no idea what the risks were. So our tools not only bring protection to your IBM I, but I would say that they allow customers to really enhance that infrastructure protection that they're building, that they're putting into place, because it, it shows how that core system is getting accessed and how not only users, but contractors, third-party support, uh, EDI partners are able to not only access what they're supposed to access, but go beyond that. Absolutely. And with the with the if you think of the the layers, right? So if we go back through our four layers that we've talked about, exit point security, we're gonna say if you're allowed to use FTP or if you're allowed to use the file server. And then once you're allowed to use that file server, now we're going to on open, right? We're going to on access evaluate if those files have signatures in them, known signatures using the Trellix engine, we're gonna monitor that activity coming through the file server for anomalous activity and block it if it turns out to be identified as ransomware. And we go to that next piece, data encryption. So through that SQL server, I've said, yep, you can use SQL, but when you come in and you hit that database and you do a select star and you wanna see all the fields, you're not gonna see those encrypted fields if you haven't been allowed to see them. And then we get to the system configuration, and this is where it comes down to the object level securities. So if you don't have authority to access that file outside of your application, you're going to get an authority failure. You're going to be denied by default to be able to see that data. And that's how just those four start working together, which I think leads us really nicely into how that multi-factor adds to these layers. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I, I this is I, I geek out on in, encryption and antivirus, all of these multi-factor authentication too, because you know this is taking that last step of you know we've done all of these things to ensure the access to the system is appropriate, that we're protecting the data, that we're not introducing malware, exit point managers controlling who can actually use which interface, but again those those compromised credentials. It's mm -hmm. game on if, the, if they're compromised. So using the multi-factor authentication, we're gonna be able to authenticate when they at the front door of the system, but when we start looking at FTP connections, is this really Sandy connecting to FTP? If it is, then we're gonna go ahead and pass it off to Exit Point Manager and say, all right, what can Sandy do through FTP? All right, she's good to go. All right, let's look at the, what is she, she's trying to get some data wait a minute, that data is encrypted. So when she pulls it off the system, it's still going to be masked and she's not going to be able to see it. Or we start looking at the uh, file server, right? So Sandy, mm -hmm. this is really Sandy. She's mapped her drive. She's able to connect. So now what is she going to be able to do? And so really being able to ensure that all of these points where there's that access to data and the access to run commands on the system that we're authenticating. And I think Amy made a point earlier in the uh, in our first session about the ability to authenticate users performing specific functions natively on the system. 
So, you know, being able to use the API that, that PowerTech multi-factor authentication provides that if this user takes this option, we're going to re-authenticate mm -hmm. them. If they are using, using privileged access management software like our authority broker, and I'm gonna swap to QSEC offer because I need to make a system change, let's make sure that that's really Sandy. We're gonna have to force her to authenticate to swap to QSEC offer before she gets to be become QSEC offer on the system. So she didn't just walk away from her, her workstation and leave her, her screen unlocked and somebody sat down and started using her access and where she was signed on to the system. So really a lot of different ways that we're going to be able to pull that back and say, first and foremost, before you get to my server, are you really that person? So I've seen some pretty cool implementations with that and actually coming up here in, in just a few minutes, we're going to, I'm going to give you guys a, a quick demo and so you can actually see how these layers of protection that we are, have been talking about can actually be implemented. So it's pretty cool being able to actually see it in motion and, and see really what the the layers do provide. Absolutely. I, I'm curious, Sandy, when you're implementing MFA with our customers, probably what's the the, the most common feedback you get when you're you're doing the, those implementations? I, you know, honestly, I'm hearing it's the, it, it making sure those administrators are validated and mm -hmm. the, you know, meeting the insurance requirements. That's, that one, uh, that one has definitely been popping up the most. And I think there's cycles of, of really what the drivers are, mm -hmm. but, you know, being able to meet the requirements that they, that they have to, um, is, is the biggest thing for sure. Yeah, and I know when I've spoken to customers about it, it's the, that integration point where we can integrate with their existing infrastructure mm -hmm. of their radius servers they already have set up, and they don't have to maintain an entirely different configuration and setup. Yeah, absolutely. Making it seamless. Um, you know, the, the, the SSO, it, that really just scares me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've got my compromised password, and I'm... Uh, you know, somebody's in, they have now have access to everything. Let's yep. make sure before that last point and really focusing on the administrators is probably what I hear the most is now I know that my admins, the people who have command line access, the people who have that all object authority, that we are sure that it is them and not somebody else. All right. Um, great conversation, I think. I hope that it was giving people some ideas and giving you some food for thought and really just kind of uh, driving home that we've got these uh, this ability to add these layers and that they are possible and that they're, you know, actually fairly easily achievable um, mm -hmm. with a little bit of work and a little bit of investment and time. You know, we're, we, we love working with our customers on this. And, you know, as you can tell, we're, we're rather passionate about the topic. Well, we do have a question about MFA out there, which I think is, is a, it, a great lead into these next pieces. But the, the current MFA offerings out there, because there's multiple, right? We have ours. There's a few others out there. Um, the question is, <clears throat> aren't the current MFA offering only bolt-on offerings. There's nothing native on the IBMI at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. There's actually an agent that runs on IBMI for with our tool that actually does the handles those requests. So yes and no, it's native, kind of sort of bolt-on. There's a lot of communications involved with it, but it is authenticating the user from the system itself, it has that agent yep. that's connect that's validating that connection before the user before the user completes their connection. So, um, it, it's that's kind of a little bit of gray area there on if, if on the uh, the the if you get down to the specifics. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. well, hopefully that answered the question for you. So. Um. All right. 
Well, I think that this is a good point to, we're gonna take a quick break, you guys. So um, we are gonna do a demo for you and actually share how these different layers can um, protect you. This is gonna be a live demonstration, so wish me luck. Um, but I do need a few minutes to get that set up. So we're gonna take a quick break and um, we will be back here in just a few minutes. Um, if you need to run down the hall, go grab some more coffee or a glass of water. Um, we're going to be right back. So um, appreciate you, Chuck. Appreciate you, Amy. Um, Absolutely. We'll be back here I'm in just a minute. I'm looking forward to the demo. Yep, me too. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll be right back at, let's say, 937 Pacific time.
All right, everybody. All right. I think that coffee break's over. <laughs> are we ready? We are ready. This is Let's awesome. Let's do this. I'm so excited. All right. So, final session of day two of IBMI Education Week. We're going to watch a layered security approach in action. So, um, this is, again, Amy and I are here to share some information with you, show you how this works. I think Amy's probably going to give some commentary here as I run through this. So. <laughs> uh, I might be, you know, asking a few questions. We'll see. I, yeah, I'm, yeah, we'll see. We'll we've see. done this a few times, so. Uh. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I'm excited. This is where I have fun, is being able to actually show how all these layers work together and provide for all that protection we've been talking about, the defense in depth, right? The deeper your mm -hmm. defenses are, the harder it is to get through. And so really, you know, ultimately, since we're not unplugging that system from the network, we need to be able to put all those layers in place. So um, the remediation services. So that's really where, you know, this is going to be that piece that they're going to, uh, Amy's security services team, they're going to be able to help with fixing all those pieces that are not working correctly and making sure all the system configurations are right. Okay, so that's your, your system level. That's where the system configurations are going to be um, given to you. The second layer, that power tech encryption. So object level authorities are set. Amy helps you figure those out. Now a power tech encryption is going to encrypt that sensitive data and it's going to mask it from on those unauthorized users. Chuck shared a lot of information with us about how this is going to happen using those field procedure programs for that automatic encoding and decoding. This will, be, this will all make sense here in just a minute. Um, the PowerTik antivirus, so the virus detection, so doing that scanning, but also the anti-ransomware protection that's going to monitor what the user's doing and then block an attack so that, you know, the, the average user action of, you know, changing a single file or renaming a single file isn't going to trigger that. It's that access pattern that's typical of those ransomware attacks. Then we've got exit point manager. So this is gonna be monitoring that activity, seeing what's happening through the file server, FTP server, ODBC server. So I'm gonna focus on those so that you can see how this layer is also controlling what a user can do. And then of course, that final piece, the multi-factor authentication. So when my IBMI credentials are provided, when that agent gets called, it's going to validate, is this really her? I'm going to have to go through that step, use my device, authenticate my connection before I get onto the system. So really going through each of those areas to make sure that this is going to be really who we say that it is and everything that's happening here is uh, correct and valid. All right. Deep breath. Let's see what happens. All right, you guys. So um, you should be able to see my screen here. And I actually want to start with, um, we're going to start with a little bit of a database transactions. Let's see what happens when we run SQL scripts. So um, I'm going to connect to my system wisdom here. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to this guy. So what's happening? PowerTech MFA just jumped in and said, hey, Sandy's trying to connect. Sandy MFA, are we going to allow her to connect or not? I'm going to go ahead and allow this connection. Use my YubiKey because that's easy. I just have to press a button and say submit. So now I'm connected. Over here on the left-hand side, I'm now connected to this database on my system wisdom. So next layer is in action now. Exit Point Manager is going to be monitoring what I'm doing and seeing what exactly is happening. So I just did a select from my database. And so Exit Point Manager allowed me to connect to the database. I was able to do that select statement. And what you might notice though, if you actually look at the data down here, it looks a little funny. So we've got the PowerTech encryption layer in place here. So this database that I just selected from is a database that we've identified some sensitive information. We've got credit card numbers, we've got social security numbers, we've got bank account numbers, all of that in sensitive information. So 
my user profile, Sandy MFA, is not authorized to see that full value of the credit card number and the social security number or the bank number. I'm able to see just partial. So really ensuring that if I'm trying to get this data off the system, if I'm not authorized to see it, I'm not getting it. So there's that third layer of protection. So now we've confirmed Sandy's MFA is really her. She went ahead and she, she authorized that connection. Then we had exit point manager saying, yeah, you can do that select, that's fine. And PowerTech Encryption said, wait a minute, you're Sandy MFA, can you see this data? No, you can't, we're not gonna let Sandy MFA see it. So she gets to see the view that we've determined is appropriate. Now, selects are easy. Let's go ahead and let's run another one. We'll do a select for Jennifer D. Smith. So Jennifer D. Smith is there. I actually have decided that I wanna change Jennifer's name. Then her name should be Sally J. Smith. So if I try to run that guy, I'm denied access. So at this point, Exit Point Manager said, hey, you know what? You have authority to this database, but I'm not gonna let you do this update. So we've been able, we've actually denied access for a specific function. Even though that user technically has authority to make changes, my I think my Sandy MFA profile has all object authority. So I'm not gonna be able to actually implement that specific update. However, because we can fine tune it with Exit Point Manager, we can actually allow specific actions to still be performed. So we did the select. Now let's see what happens if I do an insert. Yep, I can do an insert. So now I've inserted a record for Don K. Hote. So we've <laughs> he's been allowed to be added to the database. So I can't update an existing record, but I can add new ones. So let's see if we, let's go see here. I want to show you guys that he's really there. So it let me add him and there he is. But here's the cool thing, going back to those field procedures for encryption, as soon as I added that record, that field procedure program was called and that data was automatically encrypted. And now when I go to decrypt it, I'm seeing that mass version. So all of that's doing it behind the scenes automatically so you don't have to actually make any changes. User doesn't have to do anything different. It's automatically going to be handled. Now, because I ought to, don't wanna leave Don out there and mess up my demo here, I'm gonna go ahead and delete him. So a lot of powerful actions being performed here, being able to see all the information, be able to insert and delete, can't do my updates, but I am able to manipulate the system in the way that's appropriate for my job function. I think it's pretty cool. Amy, what do you think? No, this has come in uh, very handy when working with customers, like I mentioned before, where they can't necessarily get to that deny by default. Being able to control those update and insert statements where it's only a select and then having that data encrypted. So even if they try to download it, they're downloading just those mass fields with those symbols in it. They aren't getting the real yep. data. Absolutely. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect to that system wisdom through the green screen. As you saw there, I had to actually authenticate before I got on. I have command line access, so I'm actually gonna be really spicy here and I'm going to access that same database that I was just accessing through ODBC connection, but I'm actually going to access it through my typo error. So this is live TV kids, so sometimes typos happen. All right. So even natively on the system, and we talked about that, the ability to actually control that access, regardless of how that, that user accesses the data, it's that masking is still gonna be honored. So if the application itself isn't doing the masking, it's at the field level. So pretty cool that way. All right, and we had to authenticate to actually connect to the server. Let's look at something else. I wanna actually look at the file server. Such a problem, oh, those yeah. shared folders. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and connect here. And actually, let's be, let's live on the, let's, let's live dangerously here. We're gonna disconnect right. that map drive. We're gonna reconnect. Let's see, how easy do we make it for our users? Oh yeah, all right. So I don't recommend doing this, but you know, it's a really easy way to have access to um, the, 
the IFS and be able to move things around. Sometimes when I'm running into issues and I can't install a piece of software, I, do, I take a shortcut and I actually load it into the IFS and then move it over to my library. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and map that drive and PowerTech MFA just said, hey, wait, before you connect to the file server, let's make sure that Sandy MFA is really supposed to connect to the file server. That is really her. She just hit the Yuba key. Now she's in. All right, so MFA protecting the file server. Now, again, we've passed this off to Exit Point Manager. Exit Point Manager is going to watch what I'm doing and say, all right, is Sandy able to navigate the, the folder structure? Yep, I'm in, I'm in the folder. I've been granted access. Let's see if I can open a file. So the ability to open stream files. All right, I can open the file. Let's see if I can, uh, can I change the file? All right, let's go ahead and save that change. Yep, Exit Point Manager is gonna let me do that. And we're gonna go ahead and refresh here. Yep, all right, so let me change it. So I'm able to do a lot of functions, okay? Now I'm gonna rename the file. Yep, let's me rename the file. Let's get really busy with it and let's actually try to delete the file. Wait, do we really want to delete it? Yes, oh wait, what? All right, so Exit Point Manager says, nope, you're not actually allowed to delete stream files. So that's a good idea, right? User doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be cleaning up files through this share. So this can help prevent some unintentional damage to the IFS. But let's say we have something really bad happen. Like we've got a ransomware attack. We've been talking about that. So. There's that connection. I have that connection to that share. Um, I have a, an emulator here. This is not actually ransomware, but it can demonstrate how ransomware can impact the system. So this is where PowerTech Antivirus with Anna Ransomware comes in. This is gonna be monitoring my access pattern. So it's already seen that I renamed a file and I opened a file, that's not a big deal. But when I actually start encrypting files, this is really where things are going to be monitored. And this is the what we're concerned about. So we've got these files being encrypted. Now this is that malicious access pattern that we're going to prevent. So it's monitoring the access. It saw these files that were encrypted. And then the threshold got hit of suspicious activity by Sandy MFA. And now that profile has been blocked. I've been cut off from the IFS. So now that file server job that I was taking advantage of, I'm denied access. So that third layer of protection said, hey, wait a minute, we let her in. We know it's her, but maybe she got compromised somewhere along the way there. We let her do you know, the opens and the renames and the change and the updates of the files. We didn't let her do a delete, but now she really started doing something really suspicious. We're blocking her. So that third layer kicked in and stopped the attack. So essentially cutting it off, at this point, the administrator is gonna be able to go into PowerTech Antivirus, see the profile, see where that request was coming from, what IP address. So wait, Sandy normally connects from this IP address, but this IP address for the ransomware attack is another location that's suspicious. Now we know where that was initiated from. Remediation, once you've got that workstation cleaned up and you've, you've got a whole other mess <laughs> you're gonna be dealing with at this point, but this point, it's actually been stopped so that you can do that cleanup. The IFS is protected, the I, IBM I is protected from that attack. And as soon as that, you get the green light from the security team that's doing all that other cleanup, you can unblock that user and they have access to the server again. I think this is cool. A lot well, this of really good protection. Where I was talking about, it's working for you yeah. as soon as you've got it on your system and you have it configured, right? There isn't, you know, a bunch of reports that you've got to go through every morning nope. where you're waiting for your SOC team to notice it in the SIM. The antivirus, any ransomware is immediately taking action for you. Absolutely. So I'm going to show you one last little one because this is fun. Um, I'm going to go ahead and connect to Earl with FTP. So, you know, I, I think I need to show that, you know, profiles that you're not um, authenticating 
are still going to be able to connect as normal. So Sandy is still able to connect to the system through FTP and she's not authenticated. We didn't add her profile for authentication. So it's not an all or nothing. You choose which profiles are gonna to have to authenticate. Now we still have Exit Point Manager monitoring this, right? So Sandy's not gonna be able to get too crazy with it. She can't go to the HR directory, but we can allow her to go to a directory that's appropriate for her. We can let her do um, load files on the system. Okay, so now she's able to load a file. Can she get a file? Dot, uh, because I can talk and type at the same time, right? So she can put things on and off the system, but we actually controlled which directory she was gonna be able to go to. So um, controlling the actions, controlling what they're able to do. But let's go back to Sandy MFA. So when that profile connects, we're gonna make sure that when Sandy MFA connects to the system, that we validated that this is really her, she really meant to do this. Hit my YubiKey button there, allowed me in, and there we go, Sandy MFA is logged onto the system. So, you know, each of these entry points, really important to have those layers of control so we know, you know, who they are, what they're doing, make sure that what they're doing is appropriate, and if it's inappropriate, be able to stop them. If they're trying to get at data they're not supposed to, really making sure that all of these layers are in place. It's pretty cool the way they all work together to be able to protect the system. All right. Go ahead. Oh, they're really just, you know, each of them is, is a, a step, right? We don't yep. necessarily only lock one door of our house and leave all the others unlocked. No. And I, I really, I, I like the house and not, you know, example where, you know, you lock your front door. When you let people in, you don't necessarily let them into all of the rooms and you might have other locks on other doors. And that's really where these layers come in. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so kind of ran you through that. Um, something I like to throw out there is that um, something you can do is you can evaluate um, high level evaluation of your current security settings on the system. So think of this as kind of my call to action. Um, take a look at where things are at on your system. Do you have exit programs in place? Do you have users with too much authority on the system? We have a secure, our security scan, which is the source of that state of IBMI security study every year. Uh, but we encourage customers to use that to see where they're at with their security on the system. And so this is going to give you that. It, we, we provide an hour review with you, kind of walk through it, talk about what we were looking for, why it was flagged as a high risk, offer you suggestions of things that you can do, things that we can do to help. It's really about taking all of those approaches, all those layers we talked about, where do those come into play and where are they going to benefit you? So you can actually plan for what your next steps are. So figuring out your plan, prioritizing what to do first, what to do next is really the where you have to start. So implementing those layers are great, but you have to know what you're up against first so you know what you need to protect and how bad it really might be. So always an option. We we love to offer that to customers so you can you can do that. It like I said, it's free. It's pretty cool that you don't have to buy this little review tool here and uh, will allow you to run that. It All really right. does give a nice snapshot of where your system's at, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at a high level. So if you haven't ever looked at your system or if you're just starting, <clears throat> excuse me, starting to, that scan runs very quickly and it gives you a lot of information. Yep, sometimes too much information, I think, anyways. <laughs> It's all right. You got to know it. You, 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 ha you have to be brave. All right. So I think we are up to our time allotment here. Um, I really appreciate you guys joining us today for our security conversation and yesterday for the automation conference conversation. Tomorrow, want to remind you, day three of our IBM I Education Week, we've got our modernization and document uh, and BI management. So um, hope you'll be able to join us. I know that Greg's going to have some awesome information to share with you guys um, going through data growth 
and why it's important to modernize your business intelligence strategy, the modernizing and AI strategies for IBMI, and then also the importance of document security and process enforcement in the organization. So really tying back into that security. Another aspect of securing information on the system that um, he'll be able to um, really give you some great information on. So um, super exciting that we've been able to do this. I know that you know getting ready for this, we really, um, really had a lot of fun having these conversations and what can we do with it. So please uh, come back tomorrow for day three, modernization of document BI management. Really appreciate your time sitting with us. That's two hours of your day. It is uh, most appreciated. Amy, thank you so much for all of your valuable input. Really have fun with this. And Chuck too, you know, being there for us and, and providing, um, more, persp more perspective uh, from the data encryption side of things. So, uh, you know, I think this is a, an important topic. Obviously, you do too. You sat through this with us. Um, look forward to working with you guys again in the future.